Hello and welcome to Techno Social. Today's guest chose to remain anonymous. He used to work in higher education, but recently left after a disciplinary situation. He'd been critical of the university administrators about the way the university seemed to be running on a model that was more about profit in the bottom line than really benefiting the welfare of students. It's an interesting conversation. We go into the question of what is education, criticisms of how education is being done in the modern world. We talk about some of the differences between the issues in education over in America and how it's been done in Ireland, where our guest was from. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. Welcome to Techno Social. Our guest today is someone who has, he prefers to remain anonymous for reasons that will become clear as we talk. Um, so, welcome on the show. Thank um, you. So Good we're to be here. Talking a little bit. You, until quite recently, were in a higher education institution somewhere in Ireland, right? You were a, kind of a, a professor of psychology or associate professor of psychology, was it? Yeah, so I was um, full time permanent tenured position in mm. in a psychology department. Yeah, mm. and you were critical of the way the institution was moving more towards a for profit basis. Is that correct? Well, it was a, it is a for profit institution, but it was mm. um, I was critical generally of the model, but also. Um, the third level sector generally as well um, and the movement generally towards profit and away from um, the idea of public education, free education um, and a focus on a balance between teaching and research. Yeah. Sure. And as you were just telling me, essentially a disciplinary procedure was started against you, which led to you essentially leaving your position. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, uh, do you mind if we go into where we met and the kind of discussions we've had? So, um, I met Owen at the um, the Rebel Wisdom Summit, and uh, a lot of the focus there is around um, changes in in culture and political correctness and what can be said. The idea of intellectual discussion and debate and um, the feeling that we are being constrained in some of the um, public criticisms that maybe we can make. And you see that on university campuses as well. You see it in, in colleges quite a bit. Uh, I wasn't too much concerned about um, pressure from students. It was more pressure from administrators and management. Mm. So some of the criticisms I was making was around the governance of um the college, the specific college I was in, but then also the direction of um, the university sector and some of the policies around how the sector was moving towards um, internationalizing the student base, which can be done for really good reasons. And it, there's a good reason to get more international students in, or it can be done for very cynical profit-driven reasons where you... Um, starve the colleges of resources and you increase the international student numbers because they pay more money um, and you don't necessarily provide them with the, um, the same level of support. So I was seeing changes happening across the sector. Um, it came off the back of an Irish initiative as well called Defend the uh, University, or I think it might have been called Defend the Irish University. Mm. It's worth checking out online. And um, that was a multi-college pushback by professors um, against the kind of neoliberal changes that was happening in college. So th there was a, a list of things I was kind of critical of, 
but I was vocal in my college and that was not, um, it was not, uh, I suppose, appreciated. Hmm. And can you give us any, like, are there any sort of individual examples that really sort of, you know, give, give, give will give people like a good idea of the whole problem of the kind of changes that are uh, in moving towards a, a profit based model of uh, third sector education? Uh, means yes um so for example in, in in some colleges there is a movement away from postgraduate um phd ships and um postgraduate research positions um because you need to provide those types of students um with one to one um supervision and office space and there is an actual cost um to having them on campus Whereas it's a far uh, lower cost to getting undergraduates in. So there has been uh, explicit policies in um, some places where they've pushed for increasing student numbers, um, reducing research supports, and then also reducing or not replacing staff. So the staff-student ratio, and this is, uh, this is an issue in the UK as well, if you look at the work of um, Professor Gail Kinman, um, she's done a lot on this, or the UCU, um, there's there's an increase in staff student ratio. So there's an extra burden on staff. Um, the line that they use is our working conditions are your learning conditions. And I think it's ultimately it is an argument for the quality of education that that's being eroded as you um, reduce resources. Um, you you reduce the working conditions, you increase hours of teaching, um, and you increase student numbers. So that they would be particular issues that you see across the board. Mm. So what exactly was the situation that led to this disciplinary procedure being started against you? Um, so I was vocal enough at meetings where there were staff meetings um, around pushing for clarity. There was issues of communication within the college itself and um, that seems to be endemic in the university sector. Um, just the lack of clarity of um, strategic direction coming from management. And in the UK, you have vice chancellors and, and there's a big gulf, I suppose, between the vice chancellors, what they're paid and then what the academics are paid and how they're recognized in terms of their strategic direction but it was um, at a particular meeting where we had a bunch of academic leadership roles vacated so just to give you an example um, we lost our um, head of exams we lost our registrar now by lost they they resigned they left they went for other jobs um, the head of school left um the academic director left um the hr director left now these individuals were all then being replaced or their roles were being um amalgamated into different roles but there was a out there was kind of a an outflow of academic knowledge and experience and leadership that was happening in the college mm. and um the head of the college at a at a town hall meeting was giving assurances that these individuals would be replaced. And I made a point that um, I knew in a few of the cases that they'd left because of a lack of influence, that they felt that they weren't being listened to, that the corporate governance was superseding the academic governance in the college, which goes against regulation, actually. And they're supposed to be completely separate. So I raised the issue that, look, whoever is coming in to replace these people, it's an issue of academic leadership. And they need to be, they need to have influence at management level. And um, the, the, the head of the college kind of took umbrage at this and said that there is academic representation at management level and that he himself was an academic, um, at which point all of the academics in the room laughed um, because he, he's not an academic. Um, so he, that was it. That was basically daggers were out. That meeting happened two years ago. Mm. And at that point, um, he asked the current head of school to discipline me after that meeting. Um, the head of school, for, for my tone. So that was it. Wow. Um, so the head of school refused to discipline me. Mm. The, head, the head of school um, is currently um, 
he's been out basically on sick leave for the last two years because he was subjected to a, um, a campaign of bullying and harassment then himself. Um, so it got pretty serious and they were looking for any kind of opportunity to hang me on and to get rid of me. So the the disciplinary action happened um, as a result of me taking extra work outside the college, which is um, custom and practice in the college, like um, most of the academics would do work outside, whether it's supervision or their own consultancy or writing books or whatever it is. Some people even teach in other places. Um, so I took up some work just before Christmas um, in in further education, so it's not in the competing sector, um, just doing um, kind of consultancy around module writing. I wasn't teaching, I was just helping prepare a course and um, with two other people from the college. So two other people in different departments were also doing the same work. And then an email went out to all staff saying it's come to our attention, there's members of staff working specifically in this place. Um, if you're working anywhere, this is in breach of your contract, you need to contact us and let us know. So as far as I know, that kind of worried a lot of people because everyone was working, doing bits and pieces elsewhere. And it, it, it's been encouraged by um, previous faculty managers or by the academic director who'd left. And So I emailed, um, I know at least a dozen other people emailed um, and kind of confessed what they were doing. And um, everyone else got the, it, that's okay, that's fine, there's no problem with that. And I was pulled into a disciplinary um, process. So the disciplinary process led to me um, them investigating 14 months of my emails. So they went through my emails, they froze me out of the system, they banned me from campus, they stopped me from teaching, wow. and they suspended me essentially. So I was on suspension with pay. Wow. and then. Um, they eventually told me that I was being disciplined for gross misconduct, which is, um, that is a fireable offense. So um, I was suspended for what I was told would be a six day investigation. It ended up being six weeks. Um, the report that came back um, was, was <laughs> I suppose, unflattering. Um, so it said I was uncooperative and untrustworthy. And um at that point, then, I was being brought into a disciplinary meeting to decide what the outcome would be, so I resigned. Mm. <laughs> so I jumped rather than being pushed, but um, it's just, I think it's a counterpoint to some of the, the focus a lot of the times is on how speech is stifled from students on campus. Mm. And my students were great, you know, always great, and it's the thing that I miss most is interacting with the students, but... Um, I think that the big danger to speech is from management, um, administrators. You see, you see it a, a little bit in the, the states as well, um, and it's around not being able to be uh, critical of models of education, mm. um, which are hugely important. Like over in the UK, it's nine thousand, is it nine thousand pounds now? Yeah, and 9, the student. Yeah. Yeah, and student debt is increasing and you need to take loans out to go, you know, education is a public good. Um, it benefits a society to have educated um, citizens. You know, you don't vote for really bad things if you're educated in a good, broad, liberal arts education. Um, so uh, I suppose, you know, we're not employed at will here. We do have employment rights, but... Um, you're really jeopardizing your um, your job prospects if you start to take cases or um, it, it just becomes very difficult to justify even financially to do that. Um, if not, yeah, go on. <clears throat> um, so do you feel like that this is, this is basically profit motive at play here that, um, is it, is it, is it purely a matter of the management sort of seeking to, sort of reconfigure the university sector into a form that is essentially just makes more money. Is it all about the bottom line or is there anything else going on there? I think it's mainly about the bottom line. I think it's, um, I think a lot of people in management are on um, bonuses that are contingent on them bringing in a certain level of profit. 
um, and large bonuses. Um, I think there's a shift to online education um, without any kind of uh, pedagogy behind reasons for doing it. So moving online for the sake of reducing costs or for, for the sake of um, mm -hmm. reusing content um, that's produced by, say, lecturers or subject experts and, um, huh. and profiting off that. So, um, but there's, an, you know, there's a number of other policies um, in terms of, it, it's all around, it's business, it's business decisions. Yeah. And I'm not completely against the idea of colleges considering the bottom line because if you don't you're gonna go out of, you're gonna go bust you know you're gonna disappear yeah. um there's a book called soccer um soccernomics and they say there's three three types of institutions you can't run like a business fully and you can't run like a charity and um, so you need to kind of it needs to be a balance and that's um soccer clubs football clubs um mm. museums and universities so universities need to be conscious of you know their money in and their their money out but um they need to be more conscious of the quality of education and what they're actually graduating and there's a there's a move that i'm critical of as well is um it's it's a move towards employer or industry um industry focused courses which again <clears throat> your employability out of college is important okay you you you're not paying to get a degree and then not be employable. But if you allow the market to decide what courses are important, you're generally going to get very short-sighted, you know, um, courses that focus on training for the needs of the economy rather than education. Right. And if employers need people to do specific things, well, then they should be training them on the job or they should be paying them to do internships. And there's a move now back towards the internship model. Um, that I know on the continent it's very good. We're trying to reinvigorate it in Ireland, but yeah, there's it's. I'm just very cynical of their approach. It's not education. It's training, and it's profit. And it seems it seems really crazy to me what you said that that they would give managers bonuses based on making money in an educational institution. That sort of seems just obviously detrimental to every other aspect of the institution if you're going to motivate the management with that like you'd see i think most people would imagine that in an educational institution you would receive a bonus for providing high quality education doing you know putting out a lot of students who score really highly and get good qualifications and and not simply based on on yeah on making money that that that, that specific measure seems to me to be like quite quite an extreme one to be honest in terms of uh it, it's it's effect on how how the institutions are going to be run um, yeah and are you, are you, and that that is that is the case that that uh uh the man it, yeah it is um well uh, jonathan height if you're familiar with jonathan height's work he talks about the the talos of of um a thing or an institution what's the ultimate purpose um and the talos of a university is to 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 find truth or at least the research end of it is to, to search for truth. And he talks about the, the problems you'll encounter if the business Talos, the for profit motive starts to infect that pursuit of truth motive or the quality education motive. And, um, it, 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 the metricization. So that's the idea of trying to quantify, um, how good education is, the quality, and that's also become a, a big issue. And you see that in the UK a lot um, around your league tables, your, your ref um, research excellence framework, your teaching excellence framework. Um, that is very anxiety producing and not necessarily a good meter stick for quality. Because <clears throat> one of the points you mentioned there is, you know, turning out students who get good grades. Well, if you get students who come in who are just high performing students. So say you're you're one of the Ivy Leagues in America or you're you're in Oxford or Cambridge, you're very likely going to have high caliber students coming in and you don't have to do much with them, you know, they're going to be self motivated and they might do well on graduation. Whereas your real impact is in understanding the level that your students are at 
and then trying to improve their performance and understanding what you're doing in the classroom and, and the impact it's having on the students. And that's, that, that's the, the practice of teaching. Mm-hmm. And that, um, another book for listeners, John Hattie, um, really, really good, um, Visible Learning. Um, he, he looks at effect sizes of different types of educational interventions and all of the stuff that we talk about that we seem to think matters in politics and in parenting in, in a teaching setting. So given all the kids laptops or technology or um, class size or he mainly focuses on um, second level education. None of that stuff really matters. The stuff that matters is giving your educators time to think about their impact, to devise lesson plans, to um, to talk about pedagogy and uh, educational practice, um, and to uh, to engage in in the practice of learning. Yeah, I suppose that's that's what we've lost in in the profit model. We've lost that um, the slowness. Um, or the time needed for um, for proper learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes me think, I imagine something that you should be doing if you're trying to teach people effectively is really trying to inspire them. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the education itself, the word right is the Latin root educare, which means to lead out. Yeah, bring forth that which is within and then inspire again it's like to breathe life into you're really it's about reaching potential and uncovering potential which i think is something that isn't really there so much in the as you said the the metric model of education where we're just it's essentially trying to hit targets and so it's it's, the test yeah mm, it's trying to get those yeah, if you have those targets, what you're doing is you're just worried about getting a certain number of your class, you know, a, with a grade of over 70 or getting a certain pass rate, or you're just worried about your retention and your progression, those statistics. Whereas you're not really focused on leading and inspiring people, um, to encouraging them to be curious and to ask questions and the bit of education that's been lost, I think, is the personal development part. It's just filling people with facts and preparing them for a job. And they're not getting the time because oftentimes they have to work full time as well as doing a full time course. They're not getting the time for self-exploration. Mm, you know, I was reminded of something that um, Brett Weinstein was talking about at that summit we went to in a slightly different context. But I think it also applies here. He was talking about diversity and how it's a proxy for social cohesion. So the idea being that social cohesion is something we want. As human beings, historically, we're pretty violent and destructive animals. And if you can see Mm. lots of people together in a space cooperating, that means something's going right there. And diversity, whether at the level of, say, skin color or gender, implies that people from different backgrounds are able to work together peaceably but it isn't the thing itself it's just one thing that might indicate it so you might have a completely cohesive society that isn't like on a skin level diverse similarly you might have something that appears to be diverse and the people are really at at each other's throats the entire time and i think it's similar with the case of of metrics in education they're perhaps a useful proxy for people being good at the academic subjects, but they don't actually represent the knowledge and the, the interest and the creativity itself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I think there's, there's a lot of pressure from whether it be parents or society generally for people to pick um, the most, um, the, 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 the most prestigious courses. So a lot of people in Ireland say would go for medicine because you need to do the best out of the your leaving search, your which is what your A levels is it in the UK? Um, yes. You need to get the highest points to get into medicine or into architecture or whatever. But medicine in particular, um, it's not just about doing well in tests. There's a whole area of um, 
bedside manner and communicating with people and being able to deal with individuals who are in, you know, uh, maybe be given diagnosis that are terminal illnesses. And there's a whole emotional intelligence, social competency side of that. And there is a, a part of it that needs to be vocational as well. You need to really want to kind of do it to make a change in the world. And I think we've lost that idea of vocations a little bit because um, the entire model that we've built up, even beyond education, is around profit. Um, it's not really common good. It's it's just focused on how can you make the most money? Um, how can you do the most prestigious thing? Um, so, yeah, I think uh, uh, the point on diversity People can get along as long as there's something that binds them. And that's, again, Jonathan Haidt's kind of stuff. And if you're bound on a campus by in pursuit of a common goal, then it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter, you know, what your politics are. It shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. You're all there to do the same thing. Mm. But if we if we get rid of that common goal if that doesn't if that's not the purpose of education anymore well then diversity you start maybe getting issues where politics becomes an issue or you get racial tensions again or you get um issues focused on gender um and while those shouldn't necessarily just be background issues you know there's serious issues there around equality that we might have to talk about we all need that kind of common goal when we're, um, it's it, 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 in learning, it's referred to as a community of practice. So mm. where people share a domain, where they share resources, where they share an interest, they come together and one of the motivating things for them to learn is to become a more embedded and central member in that community of practice that they can help others. They become an anchor point where they can help others learn. And you don't have that community of practice if you don't have a campus and if you don't have an ethos in the college. So I think we're losing that a little bit. I don't, I, with all these things that you don't want to be too uh, catastrophizing, but um, there are definitely conversations that we need to have, you know? Mm. What, what do you think about what seems to be going on in America with the universities at the moment, where there's this real sort of hotbed tension between say, student base not all of the students but certainly a yeah. minority who are very interested in using the university seemingly as a theater for social justice yeah so um yeah there's been a lot of cases so i followed that since about 2015 um with um nick Christakis in yale um with charles murray in middlebury with the weinstein um, or brett and heather in evergreen mm. um so there's been a, a lot of high profile cases. Um, I think it's, it's obviously multifaceted. There's lots of reasons. I think a reason that's being ignored is again, this idea of the administrators and the model of education. The administrators are pandering to it. And the model is the student as customer model. And if your student is a customer, well then you're just going to pander to them. You're going to cater to them. You're not necessarily going to see it as a um, a client service. You're not going to see it as the students having responsibilities themselves. Um, you're um, you're not going to see the the necessity to have your college as a challenging place, not necessarily a warm, safe place, but somewhere that you're going to be intellectually challenged. That core aspects of your belief system are going to be challenged. That you're going to engage in difficult discussions and debate um, if you're working off a customer kind of model and if you're working off how, how can we maximize the student numbers in here and how can we implicate any kind of issues that's going to feed into why this has gotten so crazy um, but it's also this uh, John Hyde has gone into it a little bit I don't fully agree with I think his work is great but I don't fully agree with the the um, entire premise of the coddling of the American mind, but I think it is there is a bit of coddling going on. Um, and at the same time, I think there's also um, this kind of youth bashing going on, where we don't give 
young people and students enough credit. Like we didn't see that. I, I <clears throat> when I was lecturing, I um, used the James Damore case. I don't know whether you know the Google memo, um, James Damore. I used that as a case, yeah, for critical thinking. So Damore was an engineer in Google. He wrote a memo around diversity and how to improve diversity um, and why the there might be a gender disparity in um, the engineering roles. And it was completely misrepresented and ultimately he was fired um, from the company. Um, so I give this out in class, or I gave it out in class, and I started with the the most kind of egregious headline. Okay, so um, tech bro writes um, anti-diversity screed, you know, in Google. And I tell them to read that and to go and research it. And my Irish students went and researched it. And what I was really looking for is, are they going to look for the original memo? Because the first time the memo was presented, I think it was Gizmodo, they stripped it of references. So the first time the media portrayed it, they stripped it of all references, and it looked like just some guy waxing lyrical about what he thought about men and women. So the Irish students were actually really good. My psychology students were very good at finding the memo and finding it where they agreed and disagreed with the more, because he was, I think, inaccurate in some places, and how it was misrepresented, um, and how it shouldn't necessarily be a controversial claim. Um, once you understand its group level averages, distributions that differ on average, men and women, when we're talking about that, we're not talking about individuals or judging individuals. What I was kind of, well, not really amazed to see, but um, we would have American students who'd come over um, for the module, mm. they'd be in the class. The American students all were pretty outraged with the memo they didn't go and seek out the original memo and they thought um they they thought his opinions were or i suppose they impugned his motives and they thought his opinions were based on his white male identity so they they immediately kind of went to identity politics so i think that's that's an issue that you're seeing on american campuses where you if you highlight identity politics rather than just plain old politics and i've argued for this before you know if you want to deal with black poverty just deal with poverty <laughs> you know and then whoever is poor or where does inequality you're going to focus on that you know if there's it going to be um um uh high levels of black community in a particular city that are, are um in dire straits well then just focusing on poverty should get resources there but it's not going to neglect other people whether they're white or Hispanic or whatever. It's not going to impact them because you're you're not leaving them out of the policy. Whereas identity politics, it it divides us and it pits us against each other um, based on surface level differences. You know, so I think that is quite endemic in, in American universities. But again, this I think this catastrophizing it's a few high profile instances that have made headlines and I think social media drive it, you know, if you give everyone a megaphone and then you highlight when someone stupid says something stupid um, and then you get angry at that, um, it can be kind of a, a self-perpetuating kind of thing. So um, I think it's an issue. I, th I definitely think free speech on campuses is an issue. I think it's, we need to focus more on administration and administrators rather than students. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of issues in America that uh, thankfully haven't hit this side of the Atlantic yet. Yeah, which is, uh, I mean, it's interesting to me to hear all this sort of stuff coming out of America because I think in a way you can look in some senses as how uh, these sort of issues around sort of social justice could be driven by sort of a... Um, uh, sort of a for-profit model of a university that basically are engaged in somewhat typical kind of corporate pandering where they sort of see something that seems like the sort of vibe of the times and then engage in very ham-fisted attempts to appeal to that. I think a great example of that would be probably the, the Pepsi advert with 
one of that one of the Kardashians in it, where there's like a oh. special or something, and there's Pepsi, and it's just a typical example of sort of people who are money minded and not very much engaged in the world trying to replicate some kind of actual thing that's going on, but in a way that um, uh, in, in basically just a ham-fisted way that kind of looks silly. But at the same time, yeah. I think in England, at least, and certainly in my experience of university, we kind of have the other end of the stick, which is that like in Britain, university is actually in a lot of ways, not massive, not like totally, but in many ways sort of tied up to the class system here. So yeah. um, if you're upper class or middle class, especially if you're upper middle class, <laughs> um, university is kind of presented to you as just inevitable. And also yeah. you have university educated parents. University is like, it's just obvious, you know, like, why would you not? And if you're from like a background where the idea of being in a whole ton of debt for an education is, you know, that's not too worrying because you've got well-off parents anyway, it, it's, 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 again, it's presented as obvious. And I went to a, a private school and they presented it to me again as just being like obvious, just go to university. And so I turned up to university, like I was studying a subject that I was very interested in and I'm still very engaged in the subject. And I, I've certainly learned a lot, but I had no real idea why I was there other than the fact that it seemed that everyone said that it was a good idea. And then on top of that, and this is even worse, is that um, really a big reason why I was there because I um, had to repeat a year all of my friends had already gone to uni and I just saw on Facebook that everyone was having a super great time at uni and partying loads. And so to me, like really my main rationale for going to uni was that it looks like it's really fun and had nothing to do with yeah. education. And this is, um, this is like on the one hand, that's a really like I, I benefited from my university education, but that is not the right mindset to have going into tertiary education. And it's certainly, I think something that the, that, that brings universities loads of money because not only did you know all these kids it's they're leaving home for the first time they've got a grant or a loan from the government not just for the fees but also for maintenance so they've got money for just to live and so all of a sudden there's no parents you're surrounded by people the same age as you you've got a whole bunch of disposable income like guess what's going to happen everyone's going to you know go crazy well you know not everyone does this but a lot of people do and so i think we kind of have the other end of the stick which is that universities rather than having to sort of pander to students it's just sort of emerged this kind of culture that's connected a bit to class and a bit to youth culture of just people who just go to uni without really thinking about it because it just seems like a good time. And even though I did that in hindsight, I have the self-awareness to realize that that was probably really bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, you're, you're right. And um, it's not when the university is just an expectation and it's just your parents or whatever pushing you to do it. Um, I don't think people make good choices in terms of what they want to study. And there's also an issue that, you know, your university course, you know, whether you succeed or fail is not to be all and end all. So I try to really make my undergraduate students, my traditional students who just came out of school, understand that, look, try your best, get the grades that you want, really figure out if you want to be here. If you don't want to be here, if I never see you in class and you're always off doing something else, what, why are you wasting your money or whoever's paying for the, the, the course for you? Um, but if you want to be here, get what you want out of it. But look, if you don't succeed in getting everything that you want, there's, there's all, you can go back and you can do other courses and you can always upscale. And this, the idea of lifelong learning is an important one. But um, the, yeah, the, the, the parting aspect of university, I find it odd in that I think it's an important part. So going back, almost 20 years when I was in university, um, the social aspect was really important. And um, it, it wasn't as managed as it is now. So we now have head of student experience and we now have roles which just focus on, um, or the students' union, which is just focused on hosting parties and you know pub crawls and different types of social events where... Um, Previously, it didn't seem that the social life didn't seem to be as managed. Now, there was always clubs and societies and stuff like that, but there didn't seem to be as much administration. It seemed to be more leave it to the students. The students will organize it. They'll, you know, 
self-assemble into the different clubs and societies and they'll go about it. But it was, a, I think it was maybe, a, and this might be rose-tinted glasses, I think it may have been a better balance between the academic, you know, the working hard, being there because you want to be there, and then the social, the, the playing hard, the going out and socialising. Um, but there's a, there's a few other points that you made there that are worth coming back to. The, um, the idea of trying to capitalise on um, on students, like the <clears throat> the Pepsi ad you mentioned there. I don't know what it is a word for, it, um, but it's similar to kind of rainbow capitalism, where you have companies trying to ride on the coattails of the Pride um, um, Month or Pride Parade, or trying to purposely pander to get um, LGBT um, to pay pay them money, basically, and it's it's you know you can be quite cynical about it, um, but there's also the idea that companies try to outwoke the competition, and they try wow. to pander for what they think students want. Now, what I think students and young people want, and what they're lacking, is meaning. Um, we live in a um, in a, a disposable culture now, where it's convenience. It's it's everything's fast, everything's quick, everything's virtual, and I think what people generally, not just young people, but generally, they're looking for meaning. And I, I'm not at all suggesting, like maybe Peterson might, that we 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 all go back to religion and find it there. Um, but we definitely need to find it in human connectedness, and we need to find it in in vocations, and we need to find it in um, trying to contribute to the common good. And I think that's the well-intentioned aspects of social justice, it's trying to find meaning through contributing to some kind of cause. But the problem is often that it's not well thought out. It's um, Penn and Teller, I think, um, refer to activism as rather than being um, a critical thinker, you're a joiner. You'll join up with any kind of group or movement because, again, you want to have that kind of belonging. Um, so I think I think the search for meaning is a big one that we've we've lost and we've lost it because we don't really value education. If we did, we wouldn't be charging people lots of money for it. We wouldn't be expecting them to work full time and go to college, which something's got to give. They can't do both of those things. Um, we wouldn't be trying to suggest is it two year degrees in the UK? Are they trying to suggest some kind of fast route? Kind of I haven't heard yellow. of it, but it would not surprise me at all. <laughs> yeah, like uh, trying to do, uh, you know, learning is hard. Learning takes time. Education is going to take time. So trying to make it convenient and online and, you know, like a pill that you can just take and then all of a sudden, you know, you know, your classics or your history or whatever your course is. We either value it and we carve out a bit of time for people to do it which has traditionally been when they leave school in their you know, late teens, early 20s. Um, and we recognize the, 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 the economic and social benefits of having um, those traditional learners go to third level, especially increasing access to um, people who wouldn't have a family background in higher education. So some of the, the, um, the idea of class there, some of the um, economically disadvantaged areas, there's real work to do to get more people to go to third level. And I think we haven't focused on that. And um, there's, a, there's, a, there's reasonable criticisms in terms of um, courses that, um, I suppose, get ahead of themselves or courses that really have no connection to um, real world skills or, or um, employment or employability. Um, the, the the one that people often go to sarcastically is basket weaving, you know, that they don't want to pay tax money for someone to go to college to learn basket weaving. Um, mm. But the entire humanities has come under attack now in terms of, well, what's the value? You know, it's it's been a STEM-focused um, educational policy across the world. You know, that's what we're competing on. We're competing on technology and innovation, and we're forgetting the human exploration part of it. We're forgetting the humanities. We're forgetting the classics. We're forgetting the liberal arts rounded education. And that's where I think meaning comes from. That, that's where self-exploration, that's where connectedness comes from. 
And um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's a, that's a huge problem as well. You know, it's, it's really interesting that point you make about the humanities and that question of what value do they have? I'm someone I studied classics and I remember, I'm actually so grateful that I did study it and got to encounter ancient Greece and ancient Rome and the literature and the cultures. But for the three years I was there, no one actually explained to me why I was studying it or what the value was, which yeah. left me feeling a bit confused. And I don't know if this is a criticism I have of the department or just more broadly of, of the kind of the the environment that pushed me towards choosing that to study. I mean, I chose to study um, classics after very nearly choosing to study physics, essentially because I think I decided I'd rather learn about words and ideas than mathematical representations. But I thought I was a bit crazy for having had that idea. And it was only when I did my master's and really started writing an extended thesis that I was like, oh, wow understanding the classical tradition and having a grounding in Latin and ancient Greek helps me to understand language and politics and the evolution of the history of ideas in a way that I wouldn't have had before. But I didn't know that that was why I was studying it while I was studying it. And I kind of wish someone had explained that to me. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something that I did just because I was in a teaching college, I taught, across a lot of different things, right? So I also focused on the employability modules. And these modules were rolled out. Decent idea, but they were never tailored to specific disciplines. So they very much were being delivered um, <clears throat> out of department across multiple different degrees. And it was all the same type of stuff. It was how to do a CV, how to use social media, how to update your LinkedIn, how to prepare for interviews. And it wasn't discipline specific and students really didn't like it. So I took the, these modules over and um, one of the things that I, I found that the students were never told was a definition for employability. You know, it doesn't mean you getting a job out of college or where they check, you know, what is it, a year after graduation, your first destination survey, where they go and check what you're up to and they, they um, equate the usefulness of the degree to the number of people who are in jobs. That's not employability because employability, government policy impacts employability. Um, the market impacts employability. Um, it, obviously, the economy is important. So you could do a degree in construction, as many people did, or architecture. And then the ass falls out of construction industry when we have a, a financial crisis. And all of a sudden, you're unemployable in that area. Now, that shouldn't devalue your degree. You know, you can't retrospectively go back and say, oh, well, you shouldn't have done that degree. Um, degrees should somewhat have um, one eye on, on the state of the market, the jobs market, but they need to be forward thinking as well. So what we had in Ireland is we had a bunch of people who just didn't do construction then, didn't do architecture. You know, they all went into business or STEM or other things like that. And now we have, in a way, a lack of talent in those areas because um, the boom is back and people are building again and it's very expensive because we don't have a lot of graduates in those particular areas and now people are going back to those courses so yeah telling students you know one there's a general graduateness you do a college course employers it, it's like saying look you've reached this level of critical thinking you've reached this level of basic skills you are trainable you know you, you have this gen, gen, general graduateness. But employers, when you look at the employer surveys, what they're looking for, it's not really your grades or oftentimes not your discipline or oftentimes um, not your, <clears throat> your particular performance or whatever like that. It's attitude. Um, it's soft skills. It is um, the non-cognitive skills. Um, it's stuff that is reflected in well, obviously, these are going to impact your grades, but it's stuff that's reflected in your references or your, your extracurricular work or volunteering now, which is becoming you know, more important for, um, for kind of um, separating yourself out from other applicants. Um, but yeah, like your college grade is important. Your, your 
performance is important, but it's it needs to be more rounded than that. And employers real, realize that. I don't know whether colleges fully realize that yet. Mm, I mean, I wonder if it's it's something even just societal. I mean, it kind of goes back to some of the stuff we've been saying, what Dylan's saying. I think we almost come to take higher education for granted. And especially within the kind of class system, it becomes your, I often phrase it, your ticket into the middle class. The tick box that means, yes, okay, you're allowed to go and get a middle class job and be a member of the middle class. And there's, although we, we know implicitly why higher education is valuable, it's hard to to describe it in the way that we may have just described. It's much easier to just say it shows that you that that you can learn and that you mm. can focus and that you have a certain like it's kind of a metric for intelligence, I suppose. That's what we want. I yeah. I wouldn't like to see it like that. I, I think there's um there's more than intelligence that will, will get you through college. I think conscientiousness is really important. You know, your, your diligence, your interest, your, your motivation, that you're doing something that you really want to do. is the mo- Like what Dylan said there, that going to college is an expectation. That's bad in lots of respects in that you have people who are, say, high potential, high performing individuals who are going to college because it's expected of them when they could do something else. They don't necessarily need to go to college. They're not going to um, develop themselves necessarily there, especially if they're going to just party all the time. Um, but then on the other end, while accessibility is really important, if we have a policy that just pushes people into college who don't want to go to college or aren't suitable for college, and we used to have polytechnics or we used to have the idea of apprenticeships. Um, sorry, I might have mentioned internships. It's the apprenticeship model. Um, that's coming back, um, that that needs to be seen as equally valuable, you know, for for the purpose is developing the individual. It's not for getting them a job, you know. That's a that's a that's a positive if that happens, you know. But that shouldn't be the sole reason to go to college to get a job, um, and it, it's also developing a network. That it's really important that you do have a diverse range of. Um, socioeconomic backgrounds in a classroom um, because that does break down barriers and it develops a network, a professional network that can be leveraged then. So I think it's it's one of the biggest benefits for attending any of the real um, um, upper class schools like Eton over in, in, in the UK. Eton is, um, it's that network. It's having that network that you have for the rest of your life um, that you know who to talk to, you know um, when job opportunities come up, you you are you know you're first to be called when you know someone has a particular opportunity, and that's not very good when you have a very um, a very homogenous group of people. So they all look the same, they all come from the same background, they all have the same level of privilege, they all have family of a particular level of wealth, um, that's giving them an unfair advantage. That's giving them an opportunity that's not being made available to others. So as long as you have a diverse, um, um, or at least as long as you have equality of opportunity to go to college, rather than actually pushing people, saying you have to go to college, once that opportunity is there, and once you make it clear to people early on, you have like early ed- educational interventions are most important, the benefits of going to college because oftentimes if you have someone dropping out of school at 15, 16, and they're into work and it's, it's you know, what their, their dad is doing, um, they're making money. They don't, they're not thinking, you know, long term. So sensation seeking, novelty seeking, you know, is highest in, <coughs> in our adolescence. So people aren't making great long term decisions then. So you really need to make it salient why investing in yourself because that's essentially what college is you're investing in yourself is a good long-term decision not just good for you but you need to make that clear for to government that it's good for society that for them to invest in um not just young people but in lifelong education so we've been talking for about an hour now and i'm thinking it's probably about time to wrap this up um yeah 
There's one question we like to ask all of our guests at the end, which is what is a piece of advice that you would like to give to people, especially young people regarding the world and the future that we may be moving towards? Um, so I have kids of my own as well. So, and, um, it's, it's very difficult to, um, predict what you need to be doing now to kind of, uh, future proof yourself. You know, that's, it's, it's a big difficulty, precariousness, um, a lack of economic and, um, um, a, a lack of, uh, accommodation security is a big issue that you see with young people. So I think social support is really important and try and develop those networks, whether it's online, but if possible in person um, focus on doing what you want. And if you can make money out of that, then that's what you should do. But if it, you know, <clears throat> there's great research that looks at um, subjective um, job satisfaction or subjective, um, what is it, subjective job status, I think it is, an objective job status. So in other words, if you do what you like um, versus if you're paid well for what you like. So objective is your pay and status. Subjective is your interest, your happiness, your satisfaction, whatever. Um, your, your satisfaction or your interest seems to drive your pay. That seems to be the way the relationship goes more than the other way around. So getting paid a lot of money isn't necessarily going to increase your satisfaction, but doing something that you love, there's likelihood that you're going to be able to monetize that and be able to survive on it. Um, and also young people hopefully will push for something like the universal basic income. They'll push because we need a new model. We need something that's as automation sweeps in as we have um, in, entire industries wiped out. Um, we're going to need an entire new model. So hopefully we consider those questions. Um, develop a social support network, um, stay close to family as well. So, you know, people lose track of those types of supports and um, concentrate and develop in yourself in whatever way you know how. Fantastic. That's a lovely message to finish on. Mm -hmm.